Good to see everyone here this morning. Thank you so much for being here. It's going to be kind of a rough week. I know this is a kind of a last push for the holidays. So it's going to be difficult to keep our mind on what we're supposed to be doing here this morning. But let's do our very best to make sure that we think about God and worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. I'll be leading the singing this morning. Ted's going to be uh, doing the Bible reading. He'll be reading from Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Matt will have the first prayer. Uh, James is going to lead us through our thoughts on the Lord's Supper. And then at closing, Jonathan will close us out in prayer. Before the Bible reading and prayer, let's sing 627. <clears throat> we'll sing first and second verse. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in Him always and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing His blessing to Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone, abiding in Jesus like him thou shalt be thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see the reading this morning will come from matthew 5 verses 13 through 16 matthew 5 13 through 16 you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Before Matt leads us in prayer, I uh, would like to go over some names that, uh, of course, I've been mentioning, uh, some updates. Let's continue to pray for Miss Pauline. She's not able to be here with us today, a little under the weather, so let's pray for Miss Pauline Engel. Uh, understand Miss Sandra Williams had an accident this week, uh, is at UAB Hospital. I think surgery to repair a broken leg and maybe other things to come. So let's reach out to Miss Sandra, let her know that we're thinking about her, praying for her and that she has a, a good success there at the hospital and can come home soon. Uh, Rhonda Smith is going to be starting her chemo this week. Uh, so let's continue to pray for Miss Rhonda. Ann Pugh still showing signs of improvement, so let's continue to pray for her and Mr. Denny. And then Mr. Denny said Cody uh, goes in the hospital for his, uh, his treatments this week. Uh, several other things that's coming up. Of course, the holiday season will... Pray that everybody has a wonderful time and traveling and, and, and going and doing and have a good time with family. Let's make sure that we try to keep God in everything that we do. Um, those that are going to exposure next week, let's remember, I think there's 12 that are going to exposure next week. Let's pray for them. And uh, they have a wonderful time and good things come from that. And, of course, our gospel meeting coming up in February. Let's continue to pray for that with Brother Scott as he comes and, uh, and shares a his thoughts with us. At this time, let's go to God in prayer. Would you bow with me? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come here to worship this morning. We thank you for the ability you give us to be here. Father, we pray that our time spent together in worship will be much uh, beneficial to each one here, Father. We pray that we might all have an open heart in mind and Bible to your word, that we'll take those things that we hear and accept them as the truths that, that are within it. 
Father, we pray that if anyone here this morning has not yet become a Christian, that they might be encouraged by what they hear today and make that decision. We pray for Brother Joy and his family that labor here with us. We pray that you would give him a good remembrance of those things he's prepared to say today, and that they will not fall on deaf ears, but on good and honest hearts, that we might grow together and grow in spirit with you, Father. Father, we pray for your church the world over, especially this morning, we pray for this congregation, that you be with our elders, our deacons, our Bible class teachers, with each member and each family, Father. We ask that you would give us wisdom and strength and courage to do your will, and that you would give us opportunities to spread the good news of Christ in this community and around the world. Father, we pray for our country, for our leaders, for those who govern over us. We ask that you give them wisdom and, and their decision making, that it, we may always have the freedom to worship you the way that you've commanded and live our lives in the way that you would have us to. Father, we pray for those of our number that were just mentioned. We have many on our hearts and minds and friends and family that are struggling with different things, with health and other concerns. Father, you know their needs better than we know how to ask for them. So we simply ask, Father, that you would bless them and heal them if it be your will and help all of us to show your love to them and help them in the ways that we can. Father, we acknowledge that we're sinful beings, that we say and do things we shouldn't. We pray that you would forgive us of those things that are amiss in our lives, that there may be no sin that separates us from you. Father, we ask at this time that you be with us and bless this service, and may all the things we say and do glorify you in your son's precious name. Amen. Sing the first and second verse of Oh, the Depth and the Riches. Oh, the depths and the riches of God's saving grace flowing down from the cross for me. There the depth of my sins by the Savior was paid in his suffering at Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. How my heart humbly bows in his presence today, when I think of his agony, by his stripes I am free from the bondage of sin through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the debt of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full. suffering on Calvary. <clears throat> we come to the part of our worship today where we're commanded to take the Lord's Supper. For over 2,000 years, Christians have assembled each Lord's Day to worship God. And we are all, during this worship, we have things that we're told to do. It's the Lord's Supper. It's in the Lord's, on the Lord's Day, and we are to remember the Lord. We don't come or go to a shrine or an idol, but we come to the Lord's table to get symbol around. There's different names for given to the Lord's Supper throughout the New Testament. In Matthew 26, 26, it's the bread and the fruit of the vine. In Acts 20 and 7, it's called breaking of bread. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 16, it's called the communion. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 21, the Lord's table said. it. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 20, it's called the Lord's Supper. That we, we are given the elements that consist of the Lord's Supper. Here. It's unleavened bread, 
And we have scriptures to back that up. And then the fruit of the vine we are to take. We as Christians are to see action in worship when we take the Lord's Supper. It is an observance. It's a communion. And it's an ex examination of ourselves. And it is also a remembrance. When uh, observing the Lord's Supper, we can observe in a wrong manner, as we see in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. We can eat the bread and drink the fruit of the vine and not absorb, observe the Lord's Supper, we see in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty. We must also observe it in the correct manner, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. We must observe the, it on the first day of the week, as we see in Acts 20 and 7. It is the duty and privilege of every Christian on the Lord's day to gather around the Lord's table in the Lord's kingdom to eat the Lord's supper in a correct manner in remembrance of the Lord's death until the Lord's coming. Are we doing this part of worship Acceptly. We need to examine ourselves when we partake of the Lord's Supper to examine ourselves, see if we do it in an acceptable manner. Let us bow while we take the bread. Holy Father, we thank Thee for this first day of the week that we as Christians come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. We pray, Holy Father, that each one of us that partake of the bread that represents Christ's body is hanging on the cross. We will examine ourselves, and we will take it in a way and manner well-pleasing in thy sight. For it's in Christ's name that we ask. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee again for this day and for everything it means to us as Christians. We pray, Holy Father, that we will partake of this fruit of the vine. We pray that we will partake it in a way and manner well-pleasing in thy sight. For it's in Christ's name that we ask. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, and we're also, upon the first day of the week, we're commanded to give, and we have trays at all the entrances to the doors. You can leave your checks or money there and uh, be taken care of. Let us give thanks. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee again for another day, for this first day of the week, that we come together to worship thee. We pray, Holy Father, that each one of us will examine ourselves and give back unto thee if we had been prospered. We pray, Holy Father, that we will do it with a cheerful and liberal hearts. For it's in Christ's name that we ask. Amen. I told, uh, told James that I would mention the money that we were taking up for the disaster relief and I totally forgot about it when I got up here so uh, there are separate baskets for that set up in the foyer and at the two doors I think so if you're able to help with that uh, of course we've already through the uh, giving that we do all throughout the year have done that but we felt like this was one of those that we needed to do something extra so if you're able to help with that the baskets are out in the foyer and at the two doors to help with the disaster relief in those areas <clears throat> 742. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do not in name of man or creed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name, do all in God decree, do 
all in the name of the Lord. Be not deceived by worldly greed. Do all in the name of the Lord. The Spirit says in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name. Do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed has God decreed. Do all in the name of the Lord. able to stand, let's stand. <clears throat> Sing first and second verse and we'll hear from Brother Joey. <clears throat> he took my burdens all the way up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. every day walking the heavenly way he gave me a song a wonderful song a wonderful song I now can sing praises to him my king he gave me a song a wonderful song he gave me a song to sing about he lifted me from sin and doubt oh praise his name he is my king a wonderful song he is to me Hello and good morning to you. We thank you for your presence today. We have so much to be grateful to God for and so much uh, gratitude toward him now brings us together. We thank you for your presence this morning. Two quick things before we dive into our study this morning. That'll be from Colossians chapter 4. Finish out the verses that deal with Paul's instructions there. One thing this morning. Immediately after we dismiss from our morning worship, encourage all of our families to stay and to eat eat soups and sandwiches, and then after we do that, we'll, we'll carpool and figure out a way to get out and go caroling to as many houses as we can. So be sure that you stay, even if you had not planned to stay. But until now, we'll have enough, we'll be fine. So please sure that you, you plan on that, and we'll have a great afternoon together with each other and also encouraging others as well. Also in two weeks, we mentioned this in our auditorium class, but in two weeks, that'll be a new year, by the way, January the 2nd. That's when we're going to break off and begin another class meeting. We'll continue to have the auditorium class, but in two weeks on January the 2nd, we'll also have what we're calling for now the young adult class. And we'll look forward to spending that time together in the fellowship hall. So that's 18 and up, college and up. Uh, we're not going to check IDs. If you consider yourself a young adult, come to class. I told somebody a couple weeks ago that we were planning on starting that up soon. And he said that he and his wife have been talking about it and said, we hope we start that back soon while we still are young adults. And I think that's a great line. We're, we're excited to be together in that time. So be planning on that if you're in that age group or if you like studying with that age group, uh, be planning on that two weeks, January the 2nd at the Fellowship Hall. Around the turn of the century, a lawyer was pretty sick, had no idea what was wrong with him. They got him to the sanatorium of the day. 
And there was a single doctor who was just doing the rounds that night, and he got to him, and he, he really had no idea what was going on. He was concerned about the man's health and his well-being. And the man was in and out of consciousness, but the doctor said, well, sir, I really don't know what's going on just yet, but all I really know to do is to prescribe you a pretty heavy dose and regular dose of whiskey. And the man, even though he was in and out of consciousness, shook his head and said, no, I'm not, not going to do that. Finally, was able to, the doctor was finally able to talk to the man's wife and said, listen, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but this is about the best strategy that I can think of is, is this whiskey. And without this, I really don't have any, um, any confidence that I'll see him alive in the morning when I come back to check on him. And the wife almost laughed and said, well, listen, he's not going to drink that. that he, even you telling him he's going to die, he has abstained all of his life and he's not going to drink. He's willing to say, I'm, I'm not going to drink it even if I end up dying from this condition. So the doctor tried to, to, dis, to prescribe him something else and he, he gave him something, but he was skeptical that it would work. Well, come the next morning, the man was still alive. The next day he was still alive. And after about a week, the man was back to him, himself and his awareness and was on the road to full recovery. And the two developed a relationship and he kind of became his main doctor that he would see through the years. There was a backstory though that the patient, the lawyer, had never heard. So the doctor was the son of a prominent physician, had a lot of pressure on him to become this well-renowned doctor, but he had had some relationship problems, some affairs and so forth developed between he and his fiance. And over the course of that, he had become an alcoholic, was a heavy drinker. One of the things that the fiance said, if we're going to make this work, you have to put away the alcohol. You cannot drink. So he had begun that, and for these decades, he had remained sober himself. So after they've had this relationship and the decades have passed, the doctor finally decided to tell the lawyer, here's something you need to know. He said, remember that night we first met? He said, I was on the road to recovery, but I would have these intense days or even weeks when I, all I could think about was, was my craving to drink. And the first of those happened the night you came to the hospital and refused to drink even though it could have saved your life. So you refusing that night gave me the strength to push through my cravings. To, to see a man who was told, if you don't drink this, you might die, to still refuse has strengthened me all these years to be able to refuse myself. Every single interaction we have is an opportunity for influence, even when we don't know it. Every single interaction is an opportunity of influence, even when we do not realize it in the moment. As we wind down our study of Colossians, and as Paul is winding down his instructions to this church, and the rest of the chapter is Paul being personal and mentioning people by names and family by name. But his final instructions here continue a thread we introduced last week, that this is not all about them. It's not all about us. That this letter is about Christ and the difference that Christ makes within us. But he makes a difference in us so that we will then make a difference. And we saw that in the aspect of Paul's commands to them to pray for him to have an open door and to speak through that open door with clarity. And now in these two verses of chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, we see Paul addressing for these Christians how they need to be mindful of outsiders as well. So let's read together verses 5 and 6, Colossians 4. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So after Paul says, pray for me and my open doors, he then orients them now as to how they are to respond in their open doors. How will you walk before your open doors around you? Now notice first the order in chapter 4 alone. Prayer precedes this paragraph about walking in wisdom toward outsiders. 
Think about how important that is. And we're going to live among people who do not know the Lord. And we're going to walk with them. And we're going to have opportunities to show them wisdom that comes from God. But our effectiveness in doing that and our focus in doing that is going to be tied directly to our preparation through prayer. We will never be fully prepared with wisdom before outsiders without first engaging in prayer and constantly engaging in prayer to God, seeking his direction. But also notice quickly the order in the book of Colossians. This book is not primarily or at least first about making a difference, but it is where Paul ends his letter. That's important to notice. Christ precedes everything. Christ created everything. Christ created us and this world we live in. Christ is the one actively holding all things together. And he is the one who's then made the difference in us. That he is solely qualified to be our reconciler and our savior. And that leads to life change in us. That inside out approach is then what equips us to make a difference. We do seek to make a difference in the world and in our community and in our home, but that comes from the difference he's made within us. Jesus warned us in the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount about how we have to be aware of this dynamic. We read from Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. You don't take a, a light and, and just set it in a corner and hide it. You put it on a pedestal so that all can benefit from it. You are supposed to make a difference. It's when others see your good works, when you live them out among them, that they will glorify your Father in heaven. But it's just a few verses later when he begins chapter 6. There is a warning, a beware statement. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Our motive in doing our, quote, good works before others matters. And so you see that order in Colossians is important. Chapter 1, there's this walk language, just as he uses here in verse 5. Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we're filled with all spiritual wisdom so that verse 10, we can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. You get to chapter 2, walk, walk in the same way that you received him. That walk with Christ is what now equips us and prepares us to walk in a way that makes a difference among those who are outside of Christ. So while we do good works and live before men, we don't do good works for the sole purpose of being seen by them. Our aim to glorify God and to glorify Christ is primary. But also we do so knowing that influences others for good. One more reminder there from Matthew 5. Remember what he says, if your salt has lost its saltiness, how will it be restored? So the context of Colossians, think about this. If you give in, as he's warned them out about in chapter 2, if you allow their thinking to become your thinking, what value now are you to the world? If you've adopted the world's wisdom, now you are of no value to reaching the world. You toss out salt that's no longer good for anything. You're put in this position to live out the wisdom of Christ so that it makes a difference among those around you. So we ask this question, how do people who are full of the riches of Christ, that's the hallmark of this book, since Christ is in everything and holds all things together, and now he is in his fullness inside you, how do we then live among those who are not full of Christ? How do we live among those who are outside of him? So number one from these passages, beginning verse five, we must live and recognize urgency for the moment. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. It's a parallel passage in Ephesians chapter five, beginning in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. There's this inseparable connection between true wisdom and the awareness and appreciation of time. So Paul reminds both the Colossians and the Ephesians of this connection. And the phrase he uses here, making the best use of the time, 
That's something we've modernized with translations. The older translations are, are quite literal with the background of the word. It's a financial term. It's most literal means to buy back time. So you may have grown up hearing this verse or the Ephesians 5 and verse 15 verse as redeeming the time. Just think about that for a moment. Exchanging, redeeming the time. On one level, this should remind us there are opportunities. When Paul says making the best use of the time, what he's saying is you do have time. You do have opportunities before outsiders. Remember last week, Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. The challenge is believing it. Well, here Paul's operating from this confidence that there are moments of time. There are opportunities. So make the most of them. We will only ever influence the world in the realms of time and opportunity. That's all it's going to come down to, a realm of time and opportunity. And as such, they are extremely valuable. We cannot afford to waste either time or opportunity. Just suppose, what if a given interaction on any given day is the only time we'll interact with this person ever? What value will that interaction have with them and Christ? Maybe it's someone we do hold dearly, that we are close to, but who is outside of Christ. What if any given interaction ends up being the final interaction we have with them? What value will that interaction have with them coming to know Christ? What if we had to pay for our time? Would that change how we view time? If we wake up every morning and it's going to cost us $100, $1,000 to live out 24 hours, would that change how seriously we took our time and managed our time? What if we did the same for opportunities, for people and interactions? It's going to cost you $100 to interact with this cashier at Walmart on top of your bill. It's going to cost you an extra uh, you know, $250, $1,000 to interact with this soul while you're out to eat. Would that change how we view those interactions? Are, they, are we seeing them as open doors for introducing people to the name of Christ? Conservative economist Thomas Sowell is known for saying there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Now He has a lot in mind with that when it comes to policy. But just think about that in terms of time. There are no real solutions, only trade-offs. We're exchanging every minute, every hour for something. Are we exchanging it for the glory of God? Are we exchanging it and using it for the value of Christ and his riches? We all have time, at least this moment in time. As each day passes, we all have the same amount of time. We can look back on the past week and and nobody had 166 and a half hours, and, and then another person had 169 hours in the week, and we all had 168 hours of the past week. We all have the same amount. This one's challenging, but it's true. We all have enough time. God designed us, and he designed the calendar. He designed the world in which we live. We all have enough time. The question becomes, have we ordered our lives in such a way that we find ourselves thinking we don't have enough time? Have we chosen things that take up too much time that are not as important? We all have time and we all have enough time. If we find ourselves truly thinking we don't have enough time, maybe it's time to reorganize our lives and to prayerfully seek that thinking through God. We must be urgent. When it comes to these interactions with outsiders, urgency and urgency toward time and opportunity must be present because of the call of Christ. But number two, there's the need, there's the need for purposeful speech. And moving from our actions, our daily lives among outsiders into verse six, he then says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Now this reference to speech and speaking should not surprise us by this stage. We've referenced chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10 already. Filled with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
so that you can walk worthy to God. You look over and you carry this theme of wisdom over to chapter 3. We talked about this corporate relationship that we have in the church. There's the need, Colossians 3 verse 16, to teach and admonish one another. We think about that happening in worship. We think about the connection there in that verse to singing. But there's the phrase in between that says, with all wisdom. We teach and admonish, that's using words, with all wisdom. Singing, praising God together. So our relationships with each other are now directed by wisdom in our speech. Well, now that we move to chapter 4 and we see this relationship between us and outsiders, so too our speech must be guided by God's wisdom. We walk in wisdom toward outsiders, letting our speech be guided by that very same wisdom. Words he uses are gracious. Let it always be gracious. Suppose the word always is the hardest part of that verse. Always, in every circumstance. Be gracious, he says. What's gracious? It's, it's a form of the word grace. It's defined by grace. If we're going to put an adjective on our speech, it's defined by grace. That aspect of God's love toward us, it's how we come to know him and his salvation, his gift toward us. And so in some ways, our speech should always be seen as a gift to other people, a gift that shows we have been changed by God. Grace also has this connection to thanksgiving in terms of its root word and its concept. It makes sense because people who are saved by grace have everything for which to be thankful. What comes out of us, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, as we walk in a manner worthy of how we've received him, we are abounding in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is what always keeps coming out. So think carefully. What will a world... What will the world and a culture who refuses to accept God, or at least has little room for him and his commandments, what will they learn when they look and they hear people talking constantly with gratitude? What messages does constant gratitude and thanksgiving send to a world who needs God? But then he says, not only gracious always, but then he says seasoned with salt. It's acceptable, it's inoffensive. Salt had several primary uses in the first century. When Jesus references it in Matthew 5, it's probably more along the lines of a preservative, whereas here it does seem to mean, seem to be that Paul is talking about the taste of food. Let every word be thoughtful. Just as you would calculate it in a calculated manner, season a piece of meat or some vegetables, you season every word. Because of your gratitude for God's grace. How often have we said something and then had the realization, that's not really how I thought it was going to come out. Or I thought the best thing to do was to say something. Or I thought the best thing was to not say something. I thought this, I thought that. Have we ever found ourselves looking back maybe in some regret with those, those, that phrase in mind? I thought this was the best thing to do. Directly related to our speech. That's where we need to come back to God's wisdom. Are we just merely thinking and guessing and supposing this might be the best thing to do or to say? Paul says when we walk in wisdom, that demands thoughtful speech. Speech that's gracious and is a gift, but also speech that has been run through the filter of God's wisdom. So that we know this is the loving thing to say. We know this is the loving way to go about it. We know from God this is what's right and what's best. We cannot interact with people in the world without controlling our tongues and more than that, being intentional about every aspect of our speech. One author about this passage says that our words should be used to gain the greatest favor for Christ and his message. That's what salting our words would mean. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. It brings healing. Chapter 18, verse 21 of Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Healing, life, come from speech. Think about this for a moment. How much healing, how much life are now available to those who do not know Christ? 
when they interact with those of us who are. The access of healing and life is now available to those who are outside of Christ because of our interactions with them. Quick reminder from last week again, Paul says to pray for him that he would have clarity of speech because he knows that's how he ought to speak. Here you see him pulling in the same idea for us. See, clarity means that we've thought through everything. It's intentional. We're exercising God's wisdom, even in one of the most difficult areas of our lives to exercise self-control, our speech, because the message is that important. We have clarity and confidence that come from God. But number three, we continue to walk in wisdom toward outsiders with discernment still for truth. Discernment for truth. He closes verse 6 by saying, so that you will know how you ought to answer each person. So what he has in mind here is these interactions are going to bring up things that maybe are not true. People who are living by ways that are not in accordance with God. So will you be prepared to answer, still answer them, but answer them in a way that brings glory and honor to Christ? So in addition to being sensitive to time, an opportunity, we must also remember to be sensitive and aware of the person. We will no doubt face circumstances where we're tested, where we're questioned, where others doubt the way that we live or the way that we speak. But our hearts, our minds, and even our words must always be full of the wisdom of Christ so as not to be swayed by their wisdom and their questioning, their lack of wisdom and their questioning. So this reminds us that to walk in wisdom toward outsiders includes not depending on them for guidance, not giving in to them and allowing them to decide how it is that we are going to live. That's, of course, an important aspect of Colossians, is it not? Christ is the focus of Colossians, but there is the warning throughout the book. Don't let those who teach things contrary to Christ persuade you. You get to chapter 2 and verse 4, let no one delude you. And don't, let, don't be deluded by plausible Arguments. Think about that phrase, plausible arguments. Don't be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit, human tradition, elemental spirits of the world. Don't give in when they pass judgment on you. Don't be disqualified by those who appeal to asceticism or by their supposed visions. And then verse 23 of chapter 2, he says about these teachers and stuff, he says, they have the appearance of wisdom but they're useless in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. So the arguments of the outsiders will often sound appealing. Paul says they will even sound like wisdom. Thus, we must have discernment to know the difference. Plausible arguments, they appear to be wisdom. So we must know the difference so that we do not, do not accept things that are untrue. But then there's an extra layer of preparedness and wisdom necessary because he also says you must know how you ought to respond to each one. Paul didn't shy away from saying he had an ought, I ought to speak clearly. Now he says you have an ought. You ought to respond to each person in each situation from your preparedness in Christ. Not being drawn away, but also by being able to answer in a way that opens the door for Christ. While they are deceptive, Christ is truth. While they are always changing, Christ is the same. While they constantly turn against themselves, Christ is the source of forgiveness. And while they are powerless for life change, Christ offers full transformation. This harkens back to what Jesus would tell the apostles when he sent them out, Matthew chapter 10, right after he's chosen them. Behold, I'm sending you out to sheep in the midst of wolves. I'm sending you as sheep innocent animals in the midst of wolves, predator animals, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Because it's a difficult environment to live among outsiders, you must exercise full wisdom, cleverness, awareness, but also continue to exercise full innocence and purity of mind and thought as well. So this, we need this reminder in Colossians because even while we avoid their foolishness of thought, we are still in positions of influence to help them come to know truth 
and come to know Christ. All right, question about us specifically. How do these instructions about being among those who are outside of Christ, how do they impact us directly in the 21st century? If you're a first century Christian, you live in Colossae, how many outsiders do you think you cross paths with in a given day, a given week, a given month? How many outsiders, quote, outside of Christ do we cross on a given day or a given week or a given month in 21st century America? We see how this has changed the game. It's an incredible, priceless opportunity to reach people. But only when we walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. That means there's a need to click in wisdom toward outsiders. A need to post in wisdom toward outsiders. A need to search and like and share in wisdom toward outsiders. It also demands incredible wisdom to not believe everything we read on the internet. Just as we should never believe everything we're told by a person, we should never believe everything we read online. It's a blessing that so much information is available now than ever before. But we need the reminder that it's also simultaneously the most difficult era in history to vet and assess the sources of that information. We must always be holding the information up in the light of the truth of God's wisdom. We don't believe everything we read on the internet, but neither do we need to repeat everything we read on the internet. Too often I've said, I've read this, but I'm not sure if it's true. Think about how foolish that is. I've read this headline, I've read this article, I've read this report, but I'm not sure it's true. If I'm not sure it's true, it needs to stay in. It doesn't need to see the light of day. Next, we need the wisdom to speak carefully and thoughtfully on the internet. Because it lacks tone, it lacks facial expressions, it's even more difficult to communicate lovingly. It's the era where it's easiest to communicate, but it's also the most difficult to communicate with love. Thus, we need greater wisdom from God. How about this phrase in chapter 4, verse 5, making the best use of time. Oh, how much time the internet has saved us. Well, how much time my smartphone, my smart watch saves me. I don't know if you regularly get those screen time reports. If you're an iPhone user, if you've got a, a different type, you, there's still ways that, that tracks your usage. Just humbly sometimes check those hours and see how much time it's, quote, really saving you, saving us. It's tracking every minute and every hour we spend. We're going to be held accountable for how we cash in, redeem that very time. How often do we do something online, whether it's posting something or just opening to check it, and then we think, you know, I just do that without thinking. I check the timeline without thinking. I post without thinking. I open it and read stuff without thinking. Now, don't software developers, ad agencies, don't they love that when we operate in that realm without thinking? What about the devil? Does he like that we operate in that world without thinking? See, wisdom is thinking about it before we ever do it. To walk in wisdom before outsiders means we're going to think constantly before we act. So in order for us to be the positive people of wisdom for Christ, we cannot afford to get caught up in loops of indecision and loops of distraction that the world makes so easy online. So this year, 2021, and especially since April, we've been anchored in Colossians. We've been trying to think about this phrase, above it all. There's a lot of things that swirl around us. A lot of things that are distracting, a lot of things that are emotional, a lot of things that are, are dominating headlines and dominating people's talk. But what a blessing it is that through Christ we get to live above it all. We have been raised with him. We get to seek the things that are above instead of the things that are on earth. We get to set our minds on things that are above. And so now we get to see this freedom in our own lives, but also what a privilege. This text in Colossians 4 reminds us that we get to offer that same freedom before outsiders when we make the best use of our time before them, when we allow our speech to be controlled by the wisdom of God 
And it's gracious and it's seasoned always for him so that we are prepared to speak of Christ before them. An opportunity we have, but also an opportunity we have to share with the world. This morning, if that salvation, if that privilege of being above it all is not yours, you're not in Christ. He makes it available to you and he makes it clear. You can come to him through faith, confess that Jesus is the Son of God, choose to repent and turn of sin, put him on in baptism where he forgives, where he makes that difference, where he then raises you to walk in that new life with him, a life that seeks the things that are above and sets minds on the things that are above. Maybe you are a Christian, but you've not lived in such a way that brings him glory and honor. You've not made the most of your time and wisdom before outsiders. Today is a day that you need to make things right if you need to do so in a public way. Don't leave here unsure about your soul and your relationship with God. Please know that we're here to help, and that God loves you. Christ is here for you. Come to him as we sing. Broken life, so... We'll sing it through a fifth time. So once the sopranos come in, the sopranos will sing it twice.
pray together. God in heaven, we thank you for this day, this time we've had to worship you. And Father, we pray that as we go our separate ways, that we remain safe and pray for those who are not able to be here through sickness or whatever the reason may be, those that are traveling this week. And be with all of us as we, we go out into the world and to apply the things that we've learned and always keep you first in everything that we do. In Jesus we pray. Amen.